What's going on? It's your man Kali. Welcome to another episode of the Status Escalate Podcast, the music business show where every other week we dive into the minds and routines of artists, entrepreneurs, and craftsmen at the top of their trade to figure out how they do it, giving you the opportunity to implement some of their success tactics into your business, helping to plan and execute your next moves. Today, my guest is John Fuentes, also known as Sabak Red of the legendary hip-hop group Nonfiction. Aside from an MC, Sabak is a husband, father, community activist, and more. He also works with the Oakland City youth overseeing grants and programs geared towards developing positive young adults. We'll talk a bit about how he got into social activism by building with celebrities before the fame, as well as his time working with MC Search and more, and of course, a strong Q&A segment. Before we start the show, though, I want to shout out Mighty Muzz for leaving a comment on iTunes. He says, seriously... Best info I've gotten in a while. Glad I found this. Already got started on my project thanks to this. Glad to be a colleague. My man, I appreciate your support as always, my brother. Thank you. And thanks to everybody else for subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show on iTunes and everything else. Please be sure to leave your name and I'll shout you out on the next show. Now let's get into the episode with Sabak Red. I put in work and watch my status escalate. <laughs> All right, what's happening, people? This is Sabak Red, known as uh sabak red from nonfiction also known as john fuentes youth developer activist uh father and much much more yeah yeah man really dope to uh to finally get you on here i mean it's only Thanks, about man. nine nine episodes deep but i knew even before i got the first one that you were one of the people i was going to hit up i know uh Thanks, brother. Uh, on some family stuff. I mean, especially as of late, the music that I've been releasing has been uh, just about my life. But, you know, as a as a father and a husband and then just an MC, and, you know, having a day job and things like that, I know uh, that we are similar in those ways. So you were definitely somebody at, at that time when uh, I was getting married and doing that whole thing that I was thinking about, you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, just what you do was inspiring me from that standpoint. And then, you know, as nonfiction, Y'all were one of the groups that really got me into hip hop as well, like early on and and things like that. So just knew, you know, it's, dope, it's, man. even though we've been homies for a minute, it's still dope to you know to think of it from that fan perspective. So that's really tight. Absolutely, man. I appreciate that. You know, it's always good too. It's like you know, you know, to be able to have some things that are similar and align with who we are as people and as artists. You know, it's always good to to have this kind of a platform, you know, to be able to just ca- ca- catch up, you know, I, you know, even my website, you know, sabakred.com, how you helped out with that, and, you know, just thinking about like even having those conversations about the projection of where we would be. Right, that's like ten years down the line. Definitely you remember a some trip. of the conversations, right? So, yeah. Oh, we. I got a couple of those conversations that I'm hoping we get into. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it started a, a little earlier. Um, what were you doing? Uh, I mean, I don't want to get too detailed because that's for another podcast. But definitely, could you touch on like the nonfiction and just kind of like bringing up to where you're at now? And then, you know, I also want to touch on a little bit of the acting and and things like that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, nonfiction. And man, we just, uh, you know, we just celebrated our 20 year anniversary as a group uh, yeah. last year. We got together in '95, and that was pretty incredible to be able to 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 get back up with Ill Bill and Gore Tex and DJ Clips and hit the road and did some amazing tours and and festivals in Europe and Canada and here in the states. Rock some shows on the East Coast, and uh, it's pretty remarkable, man, to see like you know the Future Is Now album, which came out in 2002. Uh, still be kind of like recognized as a very, pretty classic album, independent classic. album. Yeah, yeah, man. man, and and still being able to like, you know, sell merchandise. You know, uh, we just got a statement from Eclipse literally recently. You know, we still get our PayPal, we still get our royalties and stuff like that. And uh, you know, it's dope just to see that people still have this interest and still downloading on a regular basis and putting out the box set with a, with all the material that we've had and. Just kind of, just kind of see even the younger generation catching on to stuff that we did back then. You know, with the first album being produced by DJ Premier and P Rock and Large Professor and the Beat Nuts and Necro and and Dave One, who's now in Chromio and Doom. you know, just uh, Doom's on it that? too, right? And Doom's on it, yeah. Doom's on it. The Beat Nuts on it. Necro's on it. I mean, I mean, y'all took pretty- y'all took the Illmatic. Uh, I don't want to call it the format, but y'all, man, yeah. you definitely took it on some Illmatic levels. So if anybody is familiar but not heard it or even heard it but aren't seeing it the way we're talking about it you need to go back and check it out i mean for me it's definitely one of my all-time favorite albums but just in general it's something that y'all should check out on some hip-hop shit yeah man so but aside from that you kind of got in into that with search right 
Yeah, with, with MC Surge. And, um, you know, I had met Surge back in the early 90s. I was uh, doing some um, some internship at the New Music Seminar, which is a big music festival uh, in New York City. And I had ran into Surge a few times and and I just kept running into him. You know, New York, as big as it is, it's it's kind of small when it when it comes to hip hop. Right. Um, and the circle, especially then. And I just kept running into him. And then my boy opened up for him at a show in Brooklyn. And I got on stage to rock with my boy M. Try. And uh, and then Surge seen me again and called me on stage to freestyle while in the middle of his set. So I did. I went up to the top of the dome. And uh, and then afterwards, he uh, he sent the clips, who I didn't know at the time, back into the club to get my number. And then ended up uh, giving, you know, gave my number. And then he ended up beeping me. Well, he had beeped us back in the days. It's funny. I was just doing a, an interview not too long ago about something similar. <laughs> but uh, long story short, man, it's it, I'm just remembering the story. <laughs> the pagers. What was his code? Did he have a code number? What was his nah, number? he didn't have a code number. Uh, what was funny is that, but I also gave him my home number. Right. And what was funny is, is that, um, I remember I had just gotten off the train. I got off the N train in Brooklyn where my stop was, uh, Kings Highway. And, uh, and my mom had beat me and told me that uh, this guy Surge called. So I called him back, and uh, he ended up being like, yo, I'm in Long Island. I'm in a studio with OC. Mm. And uh, he was like, come through, you know, come through. And I was like, come through. It was like 8 o'clock at night, and I didn't have a ride. And I was like, I got to get on a Long Island Railroad, but I'm with it, you know. Right. So I called my boy, Albie, who, uh, who I grew up with back in Brooklyn. And he had a car. He was like one of our few friends at that time who had a whip. And, uh, you know, he drove me out to Long Island and uh, just got in the studio uh, with Surge and OC was in there doing vocals. And I remember going in the in the vocal booth doing background vocals for one of the songs on Word Life. I actually don't remember which one it was. Um, and then me and OC became cool. And fast forward, man, he Surge just became really cool, man. I just, he, I, I would go to his crib, he'd play me beats. Eclipse was uh, living with Eclipse at that time. On Long Island, while he was transitioning from uh, from uh, uh, where, where was Rhode Island and, and the Carolinas, and um, and uh, yeah, and Search was executive producing Illmatic, so uh, yeah, he'd be right. coming through with Illmatic Nas's demos, and I'd be listening to them, and then um, fast forward a little bit, so I started doing some street promotion wait, wait, for Nas's wait, wait, Illmatic just, album. Just, just real quick, real quick, said, that's, don't that's, fast that's that. pretty <laughs> that's pretty dope. I mean, just the other day, uh, I went to a video shoot with MCA and. Uh, premiere and dub c and like holding you know just helping i mean not just help out you know whatever i could do right. but Pr preem had like his uh turntables and everything so i'm just helping him carry it set it up things like that nothing crazy but right. um it's it's kind of crazy you know i was carrying his helping to set up dj premieres <laughs> turntable so you know just probably you know in a similar way you're listening to you know i'm sure you thought it was dope at the time but I mean, there's no way you could have thought that Illmatic, this this new album that you were listening to or album in the making is going to be what it turned out to be today. But I mean, man, no, like, no, I'm going to contradict that. I'm going to contradict that. Actually, oh. <laughs> Search and I, Search and I, and MC Search, given like he's on the uh, on what he was at that time, Def Jam third base, MC Search. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, like he's he knows his stuff. And, you know, hearing live at the barbecue, hear, knowing Nas, when he had that verse live at the barbecue, and then hearing represent played, I knew that this was like the next coming to Rock M. Nice. Like, I, like what was, like, we would literally go and search his, in his truck. He had a, like an SUV. I don't remember what kind, but it was big. A Yukon or something. I don't know, but uh, the speakers would thump and we would play represent. We'd play one love and, you know, lose our minds. Like, like, like. Well, I knew, I, like, maybe I didn't know that it would have the and, and and the trajectory of what it did in terms of like right, the right. impact. But we knew that it was crazy. That's really we knew, like, chill, like, literally chills, like, we were <sighs> like, wow. So um, and I was just hyped to be able to get the stickers and go around the city and put up not Illmatic coming soon and Nas stickers and all of that and and the same with OC and then. Fast forward, it was just like, you know, um, Search ended up getting a VP position uh, of marketing at Wild Pitch Records. And for those who don't know Wild Pitch, you know, they had Gangstar, they had yeah. UFCs. I mean, they had, I mean, the list goes on. It was, it was incredible. Wild, yeah, Wild Pitch was uh, definitely the place to be. And at that time, OC had signed a Wild Pitch. So I started helping out with that, doing college radio promotion. Search gave me a little office up there and. And uh, yeah, man, I'll go up there every day, you know, just, just, you know, 
calling college radio stations across the country asking to play the word life single um which was another incredible record come on that's yeah. one of the classics uh, you lack the minerals and vitamins signs if you don't know that tom's up when you hear boom, 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 but either, if, when you hear that i don't know if you're a hip-hop head you lose your mind i think right now song. some people might be listening like oh is that the song you lack the mid okay i've heard that before you know what i mean yeah, it's like at yeah. the least you had to have heard that yeah if you didn't exactly know. exactly so in searching out you know I, and i kept writing and, and, and you know um Clips was producing beats for me and my group at the time called Pieces of the Puzzle with my boy Kevin Barnes, aka Mr. Barnes, and um, and then we split away. The search and I just kept you know working on music, and he kept you know talking about maybe putting a group together, figuring something out. And that's when I met Bill. And you know, I don't know how much we want to get into that because a lot of this information is public, so I don't want to like yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, do a podcast like that. You where know? we're so, where so we're at, out there. Yeah, where we're at right here. Um, you know, on our trip uh the last trip uh me you and Sheik took up to like Humboldt or whatever while I was car sick the whole way uh <laughs> that sucked um but I overheard uh <laughs> Bud Bundy yep exactly David yep, Faustino I, I, I have I just I just talked about that at this other interview too but I'll talk about it here because it's hilarious yeah but I remember being with Search uh you know it was actually before I was working with him at Wild Pitch before we were cool like that it was one of those times where I kept running into him and I ran into him one night at this club. It was like this 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 showcase of some sort. And I guess David Falcino was hosting it and um and uh he was also known as MC something, I don't know. But it was Bud Bunny, man, you know? right. <laughs> And uh so Search was like, Yo man, you wanna get on? You wanna be signed? I was like, Yeah, hell yeah, what's up? What's good? Like, you know, you want me to freestyle for you what? He was like, Nah, I want you to go battle him. Why don't you go battle Bud Bundy? <laughs> I was with it. I was like, yeah, let's do it. I'll, I'll go right now. It's like, nah, yeah, 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 okay. And I was ready to go. And it was like, nah, nah, you guys want to see if he was going to actually do it. You know, and I think that kind of helped seal seal it a little bit too with yeah. him knowing that I'm I'm down for that. You know, and, and although I don't do it as much often, people from around my way from Brooklyn who can tell you um, I was known as, as the person who would freestyle off the top of the head. You know, everything that, you see happening now with giving topics out, giving words, talking late eighties, early nineties. I was I was the go to. Any time there was a block party and a mic, boom, anything. They knew me as John Red, J Red, and I would go and I would just freestyle and dance too. People don't really know that I was I was a big dancer. I have no shame in that. What did you say? I was a no b boy. No shame in that. No shame. I was a b boy. But then also aside from just b boying, like well, you know, when you think about scoob and scrap. Daddy Kane, Big Daddy Kane dances or whatever. Right. I was, I would do dances like that. You know, it's chore choreographed stuff. You know, in the Running Man, going into the WAP, going into the Cabbage Patch, all of that. At that going time, that was biz. that was just the way it went down. So mm -hmm. I also yep. know that you, you you were on the acting circuit. I know you've you've done played some roles and uh, been on film, but I kind of just want to talk about some of the things, kind of like the the auditioning world or the auditioning side of the acting world. People that you used to run with, because I know people in the hip hop scene also, and I know Diz uh, or or Dash Mohawk. Yep, yeah, Dash I know that's Mahawk. that's your boy. It's right? funny, I literally, yeah, that's why I literally was on the phone with him 15 minutes before you called. Unfortunately, his father just passed away last oh, night, so he's so in bad. New York. So rest in peace, Raymond yeah. Mohawk. That's your son. That's my brother from another mother. Yeah, that. So, so you know what's interesting? I think it's important to kind of take take back a little bit when you think about the acting, the whole acting thing. It's like one of the one of the reasons why, and we're eventually we'll get into why I do what I do today. Is um is uh, years ago uh, I got the wonderful opportunity to be part of an organization called City Kids Foundation. City Kids Foundation for me literally was the foundation. It was this building in Tribeca, New York, where uh, on Fifty Seven Leonard Street. And it's literally right down the block from where the knitting factory uh, was on Leonard Street. And before Tribeca was crazy, like wealthy, and before Jay Z and Madonna moved in there and shit like that. But um, so I remember one day my boy Jose Cruz, who I went to high school with, Lafayette High School, uh, took me there one day. We got our school, went on the train, and we went to this this spot. And I was like, "Where are we going?" He goes, "I'm going to City Kids." I was like, "What is that?" He was like, "Man, just come with me. You'll, you'll see. See what it's about." And I had to do some community service anyway, so. Um, I ended up going there and going into the basement. It had like a two two story, you know, building loft kind of place. And I went to the basement. In the basement, there was probably no lie, bro, no lie. Probably about fifty to seventy young people sitting on a floor of a basement, 
and they were talking about racism, right? And I'm talking in that in that circle right there. A discussion. Black, white, right. gay, uh, tall, short, Asian, Puerto Rican, Polynesian, you name it. And the coalition, they called it a coalition. It was being led by Malik Yoba. And most oh. people know Malik Yoba, you know, as the actor from New York Undercover, Empire, Cool mm. Runnings, right. the list goes on, right? But he was the president of the City Kids Foundation before he even did any real acting gigs that were notarized on TV. And uh, so I walk in, I sit down, and, and I'm just listening. Right? I'm observing, and I'm seeing the young people talking about racism. And I'm like, well, what the, where, where am I right now? So, but I was feeling fulfilled. I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing, right? And, yeah. and at one point, a dude named Raleigh Neal, <clears throat> who actually is, is a friend of mine now, lives out here in the Bay Area as well, played with Michael Fronte and Spearhead, amazing musician, pianist. At one point during the meeting, they broke out into small groups and he asked everyone to start writing. And Raleigh started playing piano. And young people started writing these poetry, like these spoken word pieces and, and rhymes and about the topic that was just being talked about. I was like, wow, this place is pretty, it's mind blowing. It's Friday. It's a Friday night, right? Yeah. The meetings would start around five and around eight. And then afterwards, everyone would just go to the, the local diner, the square diner. If you ever seen the tribe called quest video, um, why am I losing right now? Which one it was relax yourself, relax, relaxation. I believe it was. They were in this little diner having like breakfast and whatever. That's the diner that's right down the block. It's oh. called the Square Diner. It's pretty. It's pretty dope. It looks like one of those steam. Uh, what do they call airstreams? Yeah, yeah, no, kind of things about. like one of those. Yeah, it's it's what you so think any, about when you think about a di- like a diner. Like yeah, chrome, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So people will go there, or they go down to the village, and you know they go, you know, whatever. Right? All the young people just like get on the train and just walk, and it was impactful. But before I left, my first time there, before I left. Malik didn't allow me just to leave. He was like, whoa, whoa, where are you going? He was like, come here. He was like, what's your name? I was like, John. He's like, what do you do? I said, well, I'm in school, but uh, you know, I'm a rapper. I rap. He was like, okay, cool. He was like, good. He was like, we're doing this song called What You Gonna Do About Hate. And it's around racism, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I want you to come through and see if you want to write a verse. I was like, okay, cool. He's like, but here's the deal. Make a commitment. He was like, I need you to come here tomorrow. Saturday is the day that we have our repertory company. So I need you to come back tomorrow and uh, be here at 10 o'clock. I was like, all right, cool. Went home, told my mom, listen, I'm going to go tomorrow to this place. She's like, what's this place about? Blah, 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 blah. And that, that was it, man. And in that space was literally Dash My Hawk, who you may know now from Ray Donovan or Disney right. Fam, right? Who's been in a number of other things. Oh, yeah. Um, Donald Faison. Right, who was from? This started with Clueless and did Scrubs, a whole bunch of other yeah, movies. So Scrubs, movies. exactly. Lauren Hill, wow. Fuji's. Right? Can I? You know, the list goes on. And I mean, act, like n- actors, theater, Broadway actors who now are on Broadway, and like film majors who are now directing films. And like we were young people, and we were doing creative things that were socially conscious and relevant to what was happening at that time. So with that also came the opportunity for auditions. So they would say, hey, guys, we got an open call. And mind you, need I forget, I don't want to forget that the artistic director, see Malik would be the head of the coalition who was leading the discussions around a lot of this stuff. On Saturdays, the company was led by Alex Atkinson, who was a theater major at NYU, Raleigh Neal, who was the musical director, and Jamal Joseph, who is now a professor at Columbia was a Black Panther, part of the Panther 21, and spent nine years in Leavenworth oh. and got his degrees. Wow. The youngest Panther, he's got a book out right now that um, it's called, it came out last year. It's called Panther Baby. Okay. Um, and uh, it's amazing. And he was the artistic director. He became my mentor. It's also Tupac's godfather. So Fanny Shakur will come through, you know. So you got to understand, Damn. you have young people in this space. What age, what age uh, range? 18. Is Okay. Oh, so it was all for city kids? Just everybody city there. Ki- city kids is anywhere. I mean, the youngest member was 12, like even younger at one point, but the average age is 12, 13 to like 21. Wow. Yeah, man. It was, and, and you know what else is interesting is Keith Herring. Uh, he had passed already, but Keith Herring designed the logo. 
the City Kids logo. He was a, the main part of the City Kids Foundation when it started. And the foundation was started by a woman named Lori Meadolf in 1985, I believe, 85 or 86. Yeah. So you had all this creativity. And I feel so fortunate and blessed that my boy Jose encouraged me to go to come through. You know, and I did. And I just stayed with it. And from there, you know, I just continued to to develop and 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 you know hone the craft and every Saturday would go and we'd perform from everywhere from the United Nations to the local homeless shelters and we'd do performances and it was all original material. We wrote all the material. We get we get flown out to LA, you know, we would do some amazing shows and, and, and corporate events as well. And then our spokesperson was also like Demi Moore was our spokesperson. So wow. it was a lot of it sounds crazy, right? It sounds yeah, but people wild. early on too, like most unknown and, and lesser known, definitely not. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And you know, most people, you know, right now you can ask like a a most deaf or a Talib and and you know, um people who may be considered the conscious New York or a rap of the, of the time about city kids. And everyone has come through at some point to through those doors of 57 Leonard street. You know, I remember, um, eventually I became the, uh, the director of coalition, which Malik, when he went off to do New York on the cover and all of that, uh, you a few took years later, home? I took, a, well, took out, not, for, not immediately because right, you right. know I had to finish school and all that, but, uh, and eventually I did become the director of coalition, which was his position, right? Which was amazing. And I did that for two years, um, two plus years actually. And, uh, and I remember bringing fat Joe through and he did some speaking. I was super impressed with fat Joe, you know, cause I knew fat Joe from flow Joe, you know, just, just on the scene, I happened to do a song with him at, called, um, it was about Vieques in Puerto Rico when the Navy was occupying the land in Puerto Rico. And I it got all, but, and, uh, um, he, uh, he put this all together it was me, Bobito, La Bruja, Jibo the Pro, Fat Joe, Puerto Rock, me, a bunch of Puerto Rican artists. I got a song called uh, about Viecas, Tony Touch. And uh, and at that time, I, I invited him to come through and speak to the students and it was uh, to, the, to the young people. And it was crazy. It was dope. I know that was a little bit of a tangent, but uh, nah, it's cool. But just about that creative space is where, because you talked about the acting, and I never did anything major. I mean, the only film I think I've ever really done was with my boy Dash. Actually, um, it was uh, it was his first film too. It was an independent film called Black is White, White is Black, and it is where it was all based on stereotypes where white people would play black people, black people played white people, Asians played Latinos and Latinos played Asians. And it was all based on stereotypes. Um, yeah. So I played his older brother, his more righteous militant brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like stereotypical, I got, I got the VHS, you mean? All stereotypical. Oh, all, nice. All stereotypical, <laughs> right. So it was Where? like, I think his name was Tucson and my name was Fuquan or something like that. And the director uh, collaborated. It was, it's pretty interesting. You know, it's kind of theoretical and then looking at a lot of stereotypes and, and, that and at time the end, too. I don't want to give it away. Yeah. And that time, especially, you know, I mean, this time though, that, that might not fly. I think people would be like, Hey, son, yeah. put down your, your last place trophy. That's the same right. size as the first place trophy. We got something <laughs> important to complain about. Somebody's right, making right. a satire, a satirical right. film. That right, may exactly. change things for the better. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so. I mean, so all that, dude, that's, I mean, that's really amazing because there's people our age that aren't talking about some of the things that you walked into that day. and yep. uh, Or even understanding that, yo, this is actually something that we do, we should talk about, discuss you know, agree to disagree or understand or, you know, the point, the dialogue taking place is something that people don't understand. Yep. I mean, progress, the idea of progress and things that should be a regular topic on the daily. And man, people are, are old and gray and don't realize that they didn't have to live the way that they thought they were supposed to live. You right. know, speaking my, my last show was with my man free speech. And a lot of the things he touched on was like, it's, it's almost like a tribal knowledge thing. We're supposed to just do this. Uh, there was, there was this, uh, it was like a Facebook video or something where, um, I think somebody was in like a lobby waiting for a job interview. And let's uh -huh. say there's like four people in there that are all like actors and, um, there's like a light above the door. So somebody walks in, takes a seat. I guess they're waiting for the interview or whatever it is. The light goes on all four people stand up. And then just sit down and that's it. So the person's like, what's going on? So the light goes on again. All people stand up, including that 
that new person. So mm. every time the door opens or whatever, somebody walks in the door never to be seen again or, you know, to do their interview. Eventually, the original four actors are gone and more people continue to come in, but they're just following their lead. They don't know why they're standing up. They didn't even ask. They just, oh, everybody I does it, that. so they do it. Yeah, it's amazing, right? And the, there was an Asian girl, right, who was standing up the whole time. It's the same video I'm thinking about. Not like that has yeah. anything to do with it, but I think it's the video I'm talking about. Yeah, and, and, and no and one like, asked why. Yeah, they and they just kept, and, and one person really held their ground for a cool minute. And right. um, eventually, uh, this person. Man, he he couldn't. He just all right. I guess I'm standing up too. Yep. <laughs> you know. Oh, we stand. Yep. We supposed to stand up when this happens. It's like, but not only did you not ask why, but nobody even told you to do it. You just did it because right. you've seen everybody else right. doing it, and they did it because they seen other people doing it. It's like, are you? Is anybody ever going to question why things? Right. Why you feel that something's supposed to be done this certain way? You know, right. and, and like questioning can get you in trouble or looked out like an act looked at like an right. outcast it's like you know we just need to you know anyways getting i don't want to go on that tangent but it, no, it's, no, it's, it's true it's really dope that you literally just like got taken into this and was like wow you know and yep. you felt something enough to come back that next day and you know obviously that led you i guess let's get into kind of what you do on your daily yeah. um you know the, well I, I think the interesting part about that too i think is is that one of the key moments of that of that story right there is having that adult, that caring adult, which so happened to be Malik, not allow me to walk out the door without saying, knowing that I was a new face, right? right? Knowing, not allowing me to leave without making that commitment, yeah, right? Without asking my name again, without finding out what my interests are, right? See. Lots of times we are influenced by people or lots of times we interact and engage with people and then they leave and we don't know who they are. Right. We don't know anything about them because we don't take the time to get to know them. Similar to the scenario you gave about the interview or asking why or how or who, right? Um, so that's a pivotal moment. So, you know, I think eventually that led into me wanting to, to, um, continue doing music that was conscious as much as possible and being authentic right because not yeah. every single piece of music i've ever written was socially conscious or had some kind of quote-unquote political message right. but i knew that there was purpose behind it right whether it was just expressing myself about how i grew up or the streets or or things that i was going through in my life or telling a story based on someone else's life um, but it all had some kind of uh, a thing but one thing i never lost sight of was what the skills that I've acquired and learned um, throughout that course and in school and et cetera, in terms of like giving back and allowing young people to find their voice. You know, I don't want to underestimate people in terms of saying it's not happening today because I see it daily right. that it's happening, right? I have a wonderful opportunity. When I moved out here to the Bay Area in 2005, um, you know, I was still touring heavily with nonfiction, still doing solo music. So I started doing some works in, in uh, after school programs and expanded learning programs, um, you know, helping develop some curriculum, um, looking at, you know, some enrichment programs and helping support. And, uh, and that led me to then um, overseeing a high school program um, where we had an opportunity. I had an opportunity to bring on board some amazing artists and to do some great things at the high school level. And a couple of years after that, I was able to put myself in a position I'm in now in a managerial director position where I oversee literally like eight different grants uh, working primarily in high schools in Oakland and Alameda and mostly with continuation high school students. And one of the things I know is the most important things is allowing the space to be safe, allowing young people to be heard and seen. And every young person, I think every person in general, loves the ability to mobilize, right, mm -hmm. around something specific, around a cause. Yeah. And it just takes me back to that time of like, wow, we're going to talk about racism. At that time, when the whole situation happened in New York with Malik and all that, and they were talking about it, is because in the Bronx that week, a young black male had put someone put white paint on his face. Some white teenagers jumped him and put like white shoe polish on his face. Mm -hmm. So then allowing that space to come together and feel safe and say, hey, we're going to talk about this, but 
because we should talk about it. But not only going to talk about it, we're going to do something about it. We're going to get together and we're going to, you know, write a musical piece and we're going to get creative. And I don't know, man, you can go online and check this out. But there's a there's a video that we actually did and we went up to the Bronx and we got a muralist come through and we got artists and we had this uh, this whole video shoot called What You're Going to Do About Hate. And Malik is on it. Donald Faison's rapping on it. My boy Hassan, Kevin Jordan. I'm in the video whole bunch of young people riddick bow for some reason showed up to the video <laughs> shoot with a cowboy um <laughs> omar apps showed up to the video like like it was like it was it was pretty impactful i'm, I'm gonna find that video and and put it in the show yeah. i'm gonna put all this a lot everything we're talking about is going to be in the show notes if i can yeah find it. yeah dope dope um so yeah so right now like literally my daily routine you know is definitely like you know i wake up my wife is, you know, she's a, a middle school counselor in a different school district. So she's out of the house at 7, 15, 7, 30. Um, so I get my boys ready. My son's six. I take him to school. I take my two-year-old to daycare. And then I head off to either one of the nine schools that I work with or head over to my office over in Richmond. And just, you know, I, I get to oversee these grants. So it's beautiful because it, it's, I mean, it's federal and state funding, right, that we have. Right. Um, but to be able to have someone trust my vision, um, align with, you know, what it is that the districts are looking for, making sure that young people are being served academically and socially, and especially in Oakland, man, shout out to Oakland. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, overall in the district, but that's just a systemic issue, I think, overall with education. But the ability to kind of anticipate what the needs are for young people and being intentional around, like, I'm going to make sure that young people are provided with support to young people who are suffering from trauma, which most young people are. Most people are in general, yeah, right? Yeah. I want to make sure there's social and emotional learning standards tied into whatever it is they're doing. And here's, you know, John Fuentes has access to this funding. So I'm bringing on board people like, you know, my boy, Dr. Elliot Gunn, right? Um, who was a beat maker. He's a psychologist who wrote his dissertation on like the mental development of young people with trauma, but how to be able to support that with hip hop, right? He's a, he's a beat maker. So he's got this beat making program that we bring in for our high school students. We get, you know, trade and pathway programs that we bring in, get to partner with organizations like Youth Speaks, which is a, a poetry spoken word organization in San Francisco to come in. We work with a lot of newcomers and English language learners, um, students who are in foster care, adjudicated youth, students who have been in the system and on probation. You know, one of the things alternative high schools that I work with never offered work, but were sports. So when I got the program, they were doing some basketball and soccer. And we took it to the next level. Now, on any given Friday, you can come to our local sports center here um, in the Bay, and you can see students from East Oakland, West Oakland, North Oakland, Alameda. I'm talking rival gangs, the whole nine coming together playing soccer, and their grandparents, siblings are there watching them. And but also to be part of it, they have to maintain their GPA. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like a line. So I get to have these wonderful opportunities, man, and work with some amazing adults. Like I directly manage and support and coach adults to lead the programs at their their assigned sites and schools. And it's pretty dope, man. And it's like, you know, I feel really fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to do this, you know, and, and like, I know some people will consider it quote unquote a day job or something. And oftentimes that has a stigma or indicates that you're doing something that you don't really like because music is may not be the, uh, the primary focus right now, but it's the total opposite. For well, that's me, that man. red light and filled, people standing man. up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can get paid for jobs that you like to do you can Absolutely. a day job is just a job in a day i mean technically exactly. you don't got to look at it the wrong way and if you don't like your job i mean that doesn't mean that you can't do the other things that you do love to do as well it doesn't mean you can't exactly. get another job that is better that you do like there's no one way about it period but exactly but what you get to do man like it's it's an interesting sit situation because it is like like as an artist, you have to have that passion to get through the the times of not making money or, you know, if you ever even make money, but continue right. to create your art, whether you're painting, whether you're sculpting, whether you're making music, whatever you're doing. Yep. And as a educator, or any I feel like anybody in that 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 side of things, I mean, without the passion, you, you don't belong in that in that 
field you know what i mean and exactly you really shouldn't really have your hands on it unless you're just sweeping up the place in my opinion because you got to have that passion and i know a lot of times um for being such an important um piece of people's development young people's development they may not get paid as much as they should or compensated in whatever way is the way you know a lot of people feel that they should but i think that's just another thing that kind of goes with it like that passion yep. that you have to to move forward even though the situations don't go the way you may like them to all the time and, exactly you know so when you're exactly. good at that i feel like you're making an impact on people's lives in a way that no you know few others can do exactly and that, and that's truth right there and that's 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 exactly what it should be right i think yeah. just finding that passion in whatever it is you're doing and if if you don't have that in your regular day to day then there's something else that you can find that in you know in, in in the evenings or in the mornings or whatever on the weekends right you got to be able to find that so how do you how do you mix that with your music side of things because you're still active right I mean, as active as, as I as I can be at this moment. I mean, it, the the job is definitely uh, it's consuming. It's definitely time consuming. And then having two children, six and two years old, and and a family and a wife. It's just it's you know it's it's interesting because a lot of people ask that question, right? How do you how do you do it? And the reality is, I don't do music as much. I still write when I can, and I know that um you know one of the things. And shout out to the Snow Goons and and my new specifically DJ Illegal. Um, who has been definitely on me for getting out this next album, this next project. And I've got a couple of joints that I've already recorded for it, but I'm just, I'm in a place where I just, I want to make sure it's right. I'm taking my time. There's not like a sense of urgency necessarily for me. Not, not like, you know, I'm trying to put it out because I'm trying to make a, a brand new career out of it to flip it. I want to put it out because it's authentic and it's real and it's what I feel, you know? It also, it's also finding that discipline, right? So I'm I'm extremely disciplined with my work ethic regarding like my day to day, right. right? With the youth development and the coaching and and uh, in terms of the you know the practice and what I do, um, and it's just finding that space, right? It's finding that 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 time and and putting away any anxiety and fear around like what I may be perceived as or what will be judged because we're judged now, right? Yeah, I I know that in the past like we could put out music. And, you know, you would see a, a blurb in it on in the Source magazine or maybe on a blog, on a website, something like that. Now it's like everybody and the mother, you know, wants to be a journalist and a fucking, you know, and a critic on Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and blah, 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 blah. But, but they write these long articles and no one even reads the articles. They just read the headline. And then right, they, exactly. they write their they the own article lines. based exactly. off the taglines. And it's like, exactly. <laughs> come on. And it's no excuse. It's no excuse. And yeah. I just say that because it's like, it's just to me, I'm just like, yeah, it's just, it's a turn off. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I'm, I'm going to put some, some, some blood, sweat and tears into something and put it out there and have to hear these fucking fuckheads. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, not to be so, I don't even know. I don't know how no, I hear you. I PC mean, it ain't, whatever. It, but nah, you know, but anyway, that's not an excuse. But it's just like you know, so it's just finding that that right. Moment. But you're and, doing you're doing your music. You don't feel oh, yeah, like sure. oh, I'm too consumed in all this life that I pretty much love <laughs> and doing right. well with that I can't do music, which I also love. It's like another puzzle piece. You know what I mean? No, like, no, no. The mic, the mic is set up downstairs yeah, in the basement. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, we got it. Still got rock it. shows. My boy Dion. Yeah. Still rock shows. My boy Dion Decibel, Dion who's Decibles. my engineer out Shouts. here. And, and, yeah. He's my, uh, he's my engineer out here in the, uh, in the Bay area. So yeah, we get, we get busy and you know, I'm, I'm trusting 2017, at least an EP will be, will be out. Nice. Uh, I got like three, four songs already in the bag that I just recently recorded. <clears throat> I just got to knock out a couple more and uh, and put it out there. And you know, the other thing too is honestly, I I, I miss touring. Like, but to, 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 I mean, I, it was only four months ago we were back on the road with, with nonfiction. Yeah. So I mean, I'm still I still get out on the road at least you know a few times out of the year. We do like these week stretches, so that's good. It's fulfilling and it's pretty. It's it's not. You know, we ain't making like you know the M and M money, you know, on the on the road, yeah. but we get dough considering that you know it's it's uh, it's been you know a long time since we released any music, you know. Yeah, I mean it, it it's it's really dope that you get to live the life that you want to live because a lot of people, uh, it seems almost as if they prefer it. <laughs> you know, they feel like just you know they just had a family and now I'm going to be touring 300 days out of the year. I mean, I miss touring a lot too, and I get my fix in in my own ways as well. But I've found ways to 
create music and even make money off of my music from home from yep. sync licensing or even like the podcast and things like that all create yep. income for me and they also keep me doing my music and and staying yep. in 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 that field of things that I love to be at so that I don't feel so out of place and it's like once every once in a while I get to do some music stuff and the rest right. of the year is like me being with my family cuz those are the types right. of things that if we miss out on it could really affect your relationship with your family or your coworkers sure. or whoever yeah. you know what I mean so Absolutely. Yeah. The flip side of that for me though man is like my favorite thing I mean I love being able to write a rhyme. I love feeling really good about a verse that I've written and go and record. I'm oh yeah, this up. This is good. I feel good about it. But to me, I've always loved performing live. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that's my favorite thing me to do. Too. It's just being on being on tour. Like anyone who will come to a Sabak show or nonfiction show will see. Like I'm I'm like the energizer. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm on speakers. I'm jumping. Yep. You know, into the crowd. I'm like you know I'll do, I'll do everything. You know, pause. Not everything, but you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's the flip side of it is that I genuinely love performing it. And, and you know, it's so it, it's so weird. You know, last year, no, we were out in Europe and uh we had a few days off in Austria and I just took a, a day to myself and just kind of went around and checked out a few sites and, and then me, Bill and Eclipse ended up going to the Alberta Museum and checking out a few things. And I literally have been going traveling on tour since nineteen ninety eight. Right when we went to Copenhagen wow. to a big festival out there with Company Flow and and uh, and it was uh, Bob Vito and and Mass Influence and Arsonist and all the independent groups from Fat Beats back then and right. I, I I would say probably at least one time to two times a year we travel to Europe since '98 right and then mm -hmm. we stopped when we start kind of broke up in 2005 2006 but then I'd still go out and do solo runs. And I, I just only feel like only recently have I really started to to gain an appreciation for the travel. Like we literally would be in Milan, Italy. We'd walk around or I'd walk around, go back to the hotel, do the show and bounce. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty standard, right? Yeah. But I, man, looking at it now, I'm like, I want to experience more of the foods. And we have like sitting down, getting off a plane in Barcelona, you know, in Spain and having, you know, getting off at like eight, nine o'clock at night and the restaurant being closed, but the promoter having the restaurant closed off exclusively for us, sitting down and having massive pots of paella come to us and like all the Spanish wine and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's dope, right? It's, it's great. It sounds good. But I feel like I didn't have an appreciation for it the way I would right now. Yeah. So weird. I don't know. That's just my Or being my able to thing. just experience the life more like how the locals live it and seeing exactly. the way others live and, you know, experiencing other cultures and and exactly that stuff you take that stuff home with you man and exactly yeah exactly i think the only time i ever did that was in iceland because i was like i'm probably never going to come back to iceland <laughs> so we went there once and i literally I remember waking up at like 7 30 a.m because we were only there for two nights because we had to fly out the next day to europe or two days after we did a festival and i remember waking up at 7 30 a.m and the only person who would roll out with me was our camera guy jp at the time i was like i'm going to the blue lagoon I want to swim in the hot springs. I'm here. And we did. We went out there. And it was dope. And I don't regret that. That, that to me was dope. And of course, I've never been back to Reykjavik after that. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay, well, man, I mean, I would love to just keep hearing stuff forever. We could hopefully do this again on another podcast. But we need to get into these questions. I don't want to have okay. you here forever. Take up all your time. Sure. So let's go to a quick break. And we'll be back. Status Escalade Podcast. What's going on? I want to take a quick minute to tell you about our sponsors, DeadStockCloset.com. DeadStockCloset specializes in vintage gear and accessories of all styles and brands. Shop at DeadStockCloset.com and receive your purchase hand cleaned, ironed, and ready to wear. Use the coupon code SE Podcast at checkout and get 10% off your purchase plus an additional discount on your next one. DeadStockCloset.com. Vintage flyness straight to your doorstep. And of course, if you're an artist looking to gain exposure and grow your fan base, as you should be, go to statusescalate.com. Status Escalate is a PR company who will create awareness for you as an artist and expand your brand. Status Escalate has been spreading the word on new up-and-coming artists for years with a strong focus on hip-hop. Go to the contact section at statusescalate.com and discuss a package and rates. Let them know you heard about them through our podcast and you'll get 50% off your first project. Statusescalate.com. And watch my status escalate. <laughs> status escalate. We back. My man, Sabak Red. Man, really dope to have you on the show, bruh. 
Thanks, man. It's good to, to be on the show and I'm, catch up. I'm over here fanning out. I, I need to get to these questions because I feel like you have a lot of information. You do so much. I think people that do far less than you and would love to do just music, let's say, uh, can really benefit from some of the ways that you get through your life. Um, I mean, that's what this show's about. After all, you do have a family. I know that's a big thing, you know, with me. Sometimes you got to pass up opportunities and things like that. Having a job. I mean, how how do you do it? How do you work around um, having a fam or just obstacles in, in general, you know? Um, it's prioritizing. It's literally looking at what the priority is, right? Um, and I, for me, I just feel like really, really fortunate and blessed that my, my priorities are always around the purpose. You know what I mean? Like the purpose of what I do, what I do. So when we think about sacrifice and, and opportunities, it's like my question always becomes, like, how is this going to impact or influence what my values are, right? right. My values of ch of change, whether it's you know, a substance for my family, right? Substance for myself, my well-being, uh, for people around me, for the community and the world. So, you know, uh, when we think about sacrificing, I think that one thing is always going to, for lack of a better term, suffer or be put on the back burner a little yeah. bit, right? So, for example, when I was super heavy, deep into the music and I wasn't doing as much hands-on community development work, you know, that was, that was on the back burner, right? But the music was in the forefront. But the thing that was never lost was the influence, right? Because it was all hand in hand. Now, you know, with with the community work and, and my day-to-day -day and my family, the music's more on the back thing. So that if we had a call to sacrifice, the music's getting sacrificed a little bit. But at the same time, my purpose for even doing music and new development is aligned. Exactly. So I don't feel the sacrifice necessarily. My fans maybe do, right? Because yeah. here's what I really feel bad. Not I feel bad, but I empathize a bit. And I, I feel like I, I owe it to them is the fact that people who are supporters or fans, whatever you want to call them, who hit me up constantly, they want music. They don't get to see the benefit of working with me directly uh, on a day-to-day -day basis the way maybe students in the community or my staff does. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so I, at that sense, then I'm doing them a disservice. And I think that I, I owe something to them. Well, 2017, you're going to give it to them. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I'm them. I'm part of them anyway. So, right on. so that's dope. I mean, yo, so as a kid, I mean, even before, um, even before meeting Malik and city kids and that whole deal, what did you see yourself doing? Like at this point, did you even see yourself at now? No, I mean, I, I felt like as well, there's two things depending on the age group, right? The age level I was at because I wanted to play second base for the New York Yankees. I was uh, going to be the, the Puerto Rican white Willie Randolph. You know what I mean? Like that's that's how I was going to do. That was my dream. And you know, it's funny. I still play till this day. I'm on a, I'm on a softball league here in the Bay Area where okay. I play Tuesday nights. All right. So I still play. But, uh, you know, I think that some something dealing with entertainment man i think you know as a young kid even at the age of like 13 12 i was freestyling i was i was b-boying it was hip-hop it was in me so something that had to do with some kind of performance art for sure what it was going to be I, I wasn't sure right but you, you know knew. i I knew absolutely. 100%. I mean, that's the reason why your stage, the performance is the is your favorite part. You know, what I mean, yep. that's where the energy is. You get the energy in yep. the studio too. You know, you get to yep. just make music with uh, other artists and and the camaraderie and all that. But when you're on that stage, you get that, and then some. The the energy bubble that you create with the fans and the people there. I mean, yep. I've never there's there's other things I like just as much or you know even better, but it's a different thing. You know, what I mean, it's different. a totally different absolutely. Thing. There's nothing in that lane that's ever matched me rocking a great show and exactly. it seems like just in general you're doing all the things that you wanted to do you know yep. I don't, you got your family you got a job that you love you still get to yep. make music you're even playing yep. baseball i mean yep. i don't know how often you're icing your knees or your lower back if you got this <laughs> sciatic issue you know i got I the sciatica oh, yeah, you're I fortunate only, sir recently, i only recently started feeling like a little something in the knee but nothing too, like concerning oh, you know man. i'm still quick i'm still i'm still good after this you uh, know, knock I, on wood i'm I'm about to go hit the phone roller as soon as I get off the phone with you, but um, <laughs> but that's dope, man. You're doing you're doing your thing. Um, no, the occasion the occasional Advil helps too. Yeah, yeah. I just took three, four. I got you know got the tension in the shoulders right now. But right. um, <laughs> so with all these things and with anything else, um, can do you have any life hacks that help you get through life easier? 
life life hacks yeah anything i mean it could be like this is how i make food or you know when i travel i do this or that literally anything that you feel like the average person may not know about well i think you know i i, I may have said this before i have minor ocds you know karina can tell you about some of those karina my <laughs> wife um so just you know little things to me there's also just and a part of the ocd i think comes with the sense of completion like the ability to like do something and see some instant gratification uh-huh. and completion in the moment as as opposed to having it drawn out and it sounds really crazy like right now I'm in the basement in the laundry room right of my house and I'm going to fold laundry in a little bit it sounds crazy but that's going to be done and I'm going to feel good about it uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean I it's saying. like li- little things like that it's like you know um and I'm not sure if that's what you get in terms of life hacks but you know just you know being mindful, being present. You know, well, I, I, present. I think I think it's it's the simplest way of uh, of doing it is just actually getting things done. Because I mean, this this is terrible for me, but let's say I'm cleaning my my uh, the studio. I grab yeah. some things because studio slash closet. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Right. So I'm like grabbing my clothes, putting it away where it's actually supposed to go and, uh, you know, in the closet in in a different room. And then I'm like, oh, this needs to go here. Then I grab that, take right. it to the kitchen because that's where that belongs. Oh, look, I left this in the kitchen. This goes here. So I'm like moving from one place to another. And, yes. you know, whereas at my nine to five job. I got a, a whiteboard where I write down my tasks and I knock off my tasks one by one by one by one. Yep. And um, going back to like, I know what you're saying with the gratification that you feel when you're done uh, with a task. Yeah. I mean, it's like you vacuum your whole house, you clean, you do all this or whatever. And it all probably sucks for me. It's really terrible. I don't know why I hate it so much. <laughs> I wish I didn't. Uh, it's probably because my mom used to yell at me when I was a kid. But when you're what? done and you sit on that couch and turn the TV on or whatever you do, lay down in, yep. your, in yep. your freshly made bed smelling like, you yep. know, laundry like yeah. that feeling I, f- I feel what you're saying man and the reality is that lasts for about an hour because the <laughs> kids wake up and it's a wrap right yeah so no but it's, it's it's that kind of thing i don't know for some reason i feel like i, I take pride in my ability to multitask and multitask is always a good thing right you want to stay focused but man I, I i i feel like i multitask i'm pretty efficient as well like, like a I'm juggler, pretty, is jug, yeah, juggling chainsaws. Yeah, yeah. And, my mind is always is going. Like I'm literally like sending out an email, making a call while cleaning the dishes. Like I'll literally prepare <laughs> a meal. The food will be on the table, hot, ready to go. When the kitchen will be immaculate, Damn. you're already clean. Yeah, you know I, mean? I don't know anything about that. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I do, I do do the cooking though. But that other stuff, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, I think that that, uh, goes a lot towards your prioritizing and, and being able to organize your, your days and getting everything done, man. So I, I definitely no. feel that, um, can you give me an example of a failure that turned out to be a success or even a success that ended up actually being a failure? It's a good question or vice versa. Sometimes you think, Oh, this is great. I'm so happy it happened. I won this car with well, the insurance on this car. It costs a lot of money. <laughs> you kind of in the hole, you know, things that seem really great sometimes turn out not so great as well. You know, you know, as you say that I'm thinking right now, and, and I don't want to get too much into too much detail about it, but I have to say that my previous relationship, um, which led into my current relationship was I would consider I you know I failed at that relationship it was a, it failed the relationship failed right but it led me into this new relationship that I'm in now and that's a success I mean it had, we we are obviously continuously working right <laughs> working right, on the right. two kids bring some stresses etc but man you know I've been with Karina since 2002 you uh, know I I I'll, I'll do the same thing like uh you know my first girl or whatever that i was with put it like this when when somebody um ends a relationship even a friendship or whatever it could be two dudes two girls you know or or a actual love or whatever the case is uh you should probably talk or discuss or or at least get some closure or whatever the case can be and as a child uh you know high school kid i was just like well fuck that bitch you know what i'm saying and the same thing for for any homies that i might have had that might have did something that might have been shady or whatever the case instead of actually talking about it it was nobody told me to talk or discuss these things you know what i mean right but, but when this happened with this girl at the time, I'm so happy that it did because even though at the time I was heartbroken, 
that's the reason why I ended up when I got with my who's my wife now, Delia. We ended up staying together through, you know, some rough patches because of that, because a lot of people don't learn those types of things. And yep. instead of being like, nah, you know what? I think I could have possibly repaired some of these things. So let me make sure that I, I give attention to where it needs to be because I think this one's worth it or whatever. And Absolutely. she turned out to be in, you know, so same token, man. I mean, take that with yep. you. <laughs> if if yep, you're out exactly. there listening and you're exactly. just, things are happening and you don't bother, you're just like, oh, what the hell with it. You're not following through. At least kind of <laughs> get in there yep. and see what's going on. But yeah, yep, that's definitely exactly. failure turn success. I feel you and agree. Yep. Um, yep. So with everything that you got going, how do you ensure actual execution rather than just, let's say, a, a, a idea that might seem great on paper? I think having, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it depends on what we're talking about, right? If we're talking about Music, I think, uh, theoretically or or ideally, it's it's they're similar. Um, there's similar behaviors that will go with that. But I think when you talk about executing something, I think it's the ability to again prioritize, right? Looking at you know what comes first, the chicken McNugget or the egg McMuffin, right? <laughs> we got to figure out like I'm still in that. How do we? I think I've heard that before, though. Well, I won't use it around. Please, someone. <laughs> but um, now, one thing that I will always say that I that I that I know I made up is feeding two birds with one seed. Now they say kill two uh, birds with one stone. I'm like feed two birds with one seed. Nice. Anyway, oh, um, Misty. but th- how do we? How, yeah, how do we? Um, how do I um, go about executing? I think and seeing it through is is really one is mapping it out. Right. It's funny. Karina and I do vision boards on New Year's. Right. We usually do a vision board. We get, cutouts and stuff like that for you revisiting year? it for the year like kind of for the most part of the Dope. year right whether right. it's like living you know whether it's like traveling to an, a, a, a foreign country or you know uh, making sure that we uh, put this this plan away for our kid a college fund whatever it right. is right we do that but i think it's it's really only as good as one how much you actually believe it's it's tangible making sure it's tangible i think some of the times people fail within their their goals or their expectations is because they seem to be a little bit too broad mm-hmm. and it's good to vision and it's good to picture big right see the big picture but the steps that go along with it need to be tangible they need to feel somewhat immediate yeah. so that's what i try to do i think you know one of the things that i take pride in is, is the ability to 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 be tangible to do it step by step um and to be able to uh to make sure that the team around me and i think this is helpful for anyone the team around you is on the same page and if they're not are they still part of the same book right yeah um so that you can support one another in executing whatever it is that you have um, an example can be an album, right? So you have this concept of making an album, but now what is the album called and who's producing the tracks and who's going to be responsible for which part? Um, or it could be, hey, we're going to develop this new curriculum for young people who are English language learners or who are just transitioned into this country, right? What does that look like? Who is going to be the support system? How do we hear from them? Um, so I don't know if that if that makes sense at all because you know it, there's so many different factors in which that plays, but I think it's prioritizing, it's setting tangible short term goals, yeah. um, it's a, it's celebrating when you've actually accomplished some of those, right? To f- see what that feels like. Yeah, I feel that because you can't just say I'm going to do this big huge thing and not have any clue on how it's going to happen. For and, sure. And um, knocking out these. Knocking out the, like, I have big goals in life, and I also have many goals in between, uh, goals of all levels, because you right. need to get wins, I believe. I think sometimes it's as simple as that. You need to get wins. And when, yeah. you, when you reach a goal, even if it's a small goal, that is another goal that you reached. And you're right. working towards this, and all your goals kind of are in line with your ultimate. And exactly. um, it, it kind of makes it easier to... Not kind of. It makes it easier for you to get to the end result. So I, I hear exactly. that. And I, and I think sometimes people just look at the big picture as be, being too big and either they scale it down too small, which isn't necessarily what they should do, or they just never right. try because it's too intimidating. So exactly. I hear that. Focus on, focus on what's in front of you. It's what's in front of you and, and having a value system, right? Making sure that you know what your what you value, what you what your values are and what comes into play. And I mentioned this earlier is what's about to take place aligned with what my values are. And right. if it's not, do I still accept it? Do I figure out a way that aligns or do I just not take part? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I hear I hear you on that. Um what do you have any rules before deciding to collaborate or to partner up with somebody? 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's funny because people still reach out, you know, want to collab and stuff like that. And the first thing I always say is if I don't know their music necessarily, I always want to hear their music. I want to know what they're about. And again, it goes back to, our, and I say this in an email that I respond back to them. I need to make sure and ensure that it's aligned with what my values are, what my vision is. And if it's not, hey, I, I can listen to it. You know what I mean? But I may not want to partake in that. So the rules, the, the rules are basically that one, I have to make sure that it aligns with what my purpose is for doing music in the first place. Right. right. And that's cool. And it could be anything. I don't care. You could send me some crazy, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, some crazy ill quote unquote gangster beat from, from uh Queens bridge or somebody. It doesn't mean I won't rock it. I'll hop on that in a heartbeat. Cause I'll figure out something, you know, like Necro and I did negative and positive. Right. Right. It's like, doesn't mean that, but I just got to make sure that what the content is about, isn't going to totally offset whatever it is that I'm about. So yeah. that's number one. Number two is I, one of the things I learned the hard way is I want to make sure if I do a collaboration with someone that I get to hear, the final version before it goes out because here's what people people think they slick bro they can hear <laughs> like yo for example like people wanting and waiting for the next nonfiction joint right so people like well yo let me get a let me get a verse from you baka i'm gonna get gortex in a verse and no but he's gonna do a song with this other thing on my album next thing you know they want to put a whole ill bill verse that he did for something else he thought he was going to do right. a sabag verse or something else and, and then put it then spliced it and then put it on the same out record oh i got the new nonfiction joint because they feel you know like I mean? they feel like they got the verse from you so they could do what they want with it and i'm like exactly. no you can't no you can't maybe not. some people don't care some people clearly don't care but i care exactly. tell me what you're like, gonna put do you want to join with something that you don't even like you yeah. know what i mean somebody that you may have conflict with back in the day and all yeah. of a sudden you, you're on a joint with the guy and like yo this song was supposed to be me and you why is dude on it oh well he came on later now nah, he didn't agree to that so you know man i've i've heard a situation uh a homie <laughs> i strongly disagreed and tried to deter him he purchased i'm not even gonna say who he purchased a, a verse from but he purchased a 16 from a from a very dope known artist and um for X amount of money, he ended up splitting that 16 into two eights, which I disagreed with strongly. <laughs> and then uh, he got into some legal issues, needed money. Then he sold that verse to somebody else. And I'm like, wow. that ain't even your verse to sell, fool. Wow. <laughs> that ain't even your verse. What, did you sell it as a 16 or two eights? Like, dude. So, or he said, what if he sold one eight bar to one person and an eight, eight wow. bar to another person? He split it up and even made a hook, right? Out of four bars, yeah. he made a hook. He took the ad libs, was like wow. featuring he made so -so. a dollar out of 50 cents right yeah wow. i mean some would call that a hustle <laughs> but yeah Jeez. definitely don't do that or at least man also double double check that they get that uh get your verse uh correct with the beat and don't put it on the wrong well, that's to me yeah that's the other thing man i've had that happen like a bunch of times too much you know because honestly like i've had i've done tons of collabos right actually I, I was putting out the collabo collection volume one two and three because just collaborations um that i've done throughout the course of the years of doing stuff and it was great and definitely i've had a handful where i'm like yo man you didn't line up my vocals correctly <sighs> dude like you crazy or, or it's on but it's not on the right like you come in on the one and they put you in on the yes. three or something like that it's like yes. you don't notice that that sounds weird come on and i sent you a reference so you got to exactly. put yeah, artists if, if you don't want to man if you're sending an acapella or even tracked out you know to people you got to leave that beat or the piece of the reference track just before your song your verse comes in and just after right. your verse is over so that they they lay that whole thing in there and they kind of know even then man people figure out a way to ruin it man exactly <laughs> you get me hype over here anyways we moving <laughs> on to the it. next one <laughs> moving on to the next one um can you give us a, a book movie or any reading recommendation article essay whatever actually it's twofold here a movie that i'm really excited to go and check out the documentary um is uh, finding joseph what is that? um it's uh it's the documentary of hr from bad brains um so if you don't know bad brains historic historic uh band from uh, back in the days and just amazing vocalist hr is was um so and actually a friend of mine howie abrams who has done stuff for years and has supported nonfiction, has a podcast with bill bill um did the book um finding joseph you can get it on amazon right now 
Um, so that's actually a twofold. That's a book and a movie mm. I would definitely recommend. And and I think that even if you weren't into to punk hardcore, um, looking at HR as an artist and what he was able to do and even break barriers, right, in terms of what punk um, rock was in in the uh, in the era when it was in CBGBs, et cetera, and seeing a uh, African American male lead singer, uh, when and having an influence of of reggae and ska and hardcore and metal um, infused, it's it's pretty incredible, and and the vocals are absolutely phenomenal. And thinking about just the messaging of the music, um, so yeah, that's actually right there. I would say for sure. Uh, finding Joseph, the book and the movie. I'll put whatever links I can find the note section for sure to check that out. Uh, we're getting to the end. This right here is called the top three. Can you give me one do one don't and one must have one do one don't and one must have. Yes, wow. Sir. One do. Wow. One do um, smile, mm. smile more. And not everything is sweet, man. Not everything is always happy, but it's proven scientifically, medically, um, spiritually. If you smile more, like you'll, it'll reap health benefits, mm -hmm. releases endorphins, make you stronger, right? Uh, you feel more comfortable in your skin if you smile more. So every time you're ready to take a picture with a rapper and you want to give an ice grill or duck face, Zoolander face, smile watch the <laughs> difference <said> Zoolander. <laughs> watch the difference i started doing that last tour i'm like nah man smile you can take a picture of me smile you know what i mean you, you were just smiling you were just smiling you were just smiling at the show you just gave us a smile but okay, I, I took a picture the way, you grilling. the way and i've done it i still do it yeah yeah you do it. it there's a time for it the way you smile when someone pulls out a camera that that's the opposite for some people like they're smiling the whole time when the camera comes out then they make the, the mean face right like they think exactly. we in, in, like the cameras were just created back in the day you seen a million ways to die in the west or something like that uh -huh. <laughs> that uh seth mcfarlane movie with like uh sarah silverman and uh but they keep making a joke about like how uh everybody takes pictures with the mean face and they hear like a legend <laughs> about somebody who once took a picture with a smile oh, <laughs> and really? it's like this legend yeah this is a funny that's episode funny. it's a good one if you into that that's type funny. of uh oh okay i hijacked your shit so that's the do okay. smile <laughs> so yes do's don'ts yeah one don't don't uh, don't Okay, so this is going to sound somewhat hypocritical because I do it on occasion, but don't text and drive. It sounds mm -hmm. like a PSA, but you corny if you do that, man. You're <laughs> corny. And, you know, right now I got two kids in my vehicle. Not literally right now, the second is in bed. <laughs> well, but you texting. know what I mean? Like this, <laughs> like this time, like I'm on the phone, right? Like driving. No, I, it bothers me, dude. It bothers me. Yeah. Traffic is heavier because of it because people are paying attention. Traffic is getting heavier. People are getting into accidents. Like, don't jeopardize your life, the life of me and my children because you want to fucking, you want to check your Facebook or Instagram because you can't wait to get home and get your nut off. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, like, chill, chill. Don't do it. Don't play yourself. Yeah. Same here, man. That's my I need, tangent. I need, I need That's my tangent. Off, I need to get off that much. I mean, I don't do it as much, but sometimes it's just like everyone does. But it's corny, man. I even, I like I said, I do it every one now and then. But just yeah. don't. Let's not do it. Let's yeah, just, yeah. Do it less that, for sure. That comes up to mind. So you said don't <laughs> something. Don't do, and a must have. Yeah. Sleep. Mm. Rest. So I know Nas. Nah, sleep is the cousin of death. I get it. I understand no it. No sleep maybe is because maybe, death. <laughs> maybe because I'm sleep deprived right now, you know, whatever. But must have is a good night's sleep, man. It just puts us in a better mood. Man, at least six. I want to say that six. in a pair of Jordan 3s, you know, <laughs> that's just because... <laughs> that's just because what i you know my favorite shoe even though there's controversy around it i'm the one but sir. Man, i stick to the at least one <laughs> i'm simple man. one's a good two yeah you want three is a crazy though yeah man i hear you on the sleep if y'all don't get if you one of those people who are always tired and never get sleep but you're like yo man i can't sleep because you know i got to get this money i got the hustle right yo if you keep doing this you're gonna get so sick you're gonna be asleep for like a week bro and you're right. gonna be out of business 
Figure it out. Keep work. Experiment with things. Right. Figure out if you're taking naps, do a nap, dog. You know, whatever it is. Maybe you got sleep apnea. You can right. sleep for like 16 hours and feel like you ain't got no rest. You got sleep apnea. Exactly. Figure it exactly. out though, because that that's gonna make you work better. Picture a car with no with with that needs an oil change and you know on an empty tank of gas but still going and all you know everything's on low. Like that's basically you. <laughs> you need to recharge yourself. Period. Yep. Do yep. that shit. Exactly. Your your exactly. your your results for everything you do will be much better off of some yeah. good night's sleep for sure. You know when we hang out the phone, I'm gonna be like when we're done with the podcast. You know when we're done with the podcast, I'm gonna be like must haves. Damn, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> like you know must have the nonfiction futures now album. <laughs> you know must have the autobiography of Malcolm X. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I hear you want to sleep. Um, let's just leave. This is how I like to end it. Leave our listeners with some words to live by. Words to live by. Uh, it's, a, it's a quote that I genuinely really love. And it's, it's, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Word. And then I, last one I would say, words to live by, which is my personal one, is sharing is daring. And I dare you to continue to share. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice that's my that's, that's what we're doing here we we sharing we're trying to give information however you guys could get along with your lives better and and handle that journey better make your music make your make your art or whatever business that you're doing man we over here to spread the word not hoard information we over here trying to help each other not you know pull each other back man dream big you know do everything that you got to do Man, and just make it happen. Be about your actions and execute your your ideas. Don't think that you got all the best ideas in the world and never even try one of them, please. Yeah, so man, that was great, dude. I appreciate you giving me uh, the time, dude, and Absolutely. jumping on Thank the phone is good. Catching up with you too, man. Um, Let's talk next week. About, yeah, like uh, Southern SoCal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. We'll we'll do that. Um, before we get out of here, can you? Uh, Man, give your contact information, whatever, if it's your social media, however, if anybody could get in contact with you, how they could uh, purchase your music or just any current sure. things that you got going, maybe the next time you're hitting the road, anything like that. So, absolutely. So, yeah. So, um, contact, you could just Sabak Red, uh, Facebook, Sabak Red, Instagram, Sabak Red, uh, Twitter. Although I'm the worst on the gram, man. Like Gore-Tex gets at me all the time. You need to post more. You need to, because I got classic pictures that I just don't even throw up there. Or every once in a while, I throw up there. So yeah, so social media, sorry, no tangent. Uh, <laughs> Spockred.com, not as active. <laughs> so, so that's going on. Uh, definitely trusting that I'll complete this this EP or full album with the Snow Goons, um, tentatively titled uh, "The Inside of Insomnia." So uh, hopefully that'll be that, sleep. All <laughs> right, exactly. You see where that's going because <clears throat> that's when the rhymes are written. Um, Sabak Red iTunes will be coming soon. Eclipse is working on that now, which you'll be able to get a lot of the uh, long overdue because a lot of stuff is on there anyway. So you know you can you can still cop the Ritual and Sabaklips album yeah. um, at the uh, at the iTunes Psychological Records iTunes um, Nonfiction iTunes all up there and available as well. That continues to do really well if you want music. But also just YouTube, Sabak Red, and Google Sabak Red and get all the information and take it from there. I mean, the reality is right now with Google and technology, it's all accessible. So, yeah, man. Yeah, man. And that's about it, dude. So, cool. man, check out my man Sabak Red. I hope y'all enjoyed the show. We're about to get on out of here. Status Escalade Podcast. Peace, Peace to the colleagues. Thanks to my fam Sabak Red for another great episode and everything he continues to do for the youth in his community, man. Be sure to check out the show notes at 310music.net for all links and details of what we discussed in the episode, including how to find and contact our guest in his top three. Please be sure to visit platformcollection.com for other great shows on the network like the Tumex Hologram Podcast and Hologram Radio with the big homie Tumex, really though with my fam Cookbook at LA Symphony, the Crappy Awesome Podcast with my fresh day brothers Mr. Arash and Kill C. Ray, my other show Proof of Life Ray, Radio and a bunch more on the Platform Collection Network. Also be on the lookout for the new 24-hour hip-hop non-stop radio station that my man Tumex is putting down. You can catch segments of this show as well as uh, Proof of Life Radio and just so much rare dope hip-hop. So that's definitely the place you want to be. It'll be launching soon, so stay tuned. Also want to say thanks to our sponsors, Deadstockcloset.com. Deadstockcloset specializes in vintage gear and accessories of all styles and brands. Shop at Deadstockcloset.com and receive your purchase ironed, cleaned, and ready 
ready to wear. Use the coupon code SE Podcast at checkout and get 10% off your first purchase plus an additional discount for your next one. Deadstockcloset.com. Vintage flyness straight to your doorstep. And of course, thanks to StatusEscalate.com. Status Escalate's a PR company whose purpose is to create awareness for you as an artist and expand your brand. Status Escalate's been spreading the word on new up-and-coming hip-hop artists for years. Go to the contact section at StatusEscalate.com to discuss a package and rates. Let them know you heard about them through this podcast and get 50% off your first project. StatusEscalate.com. And that's it. I'll catch y'all in two weeks with a new guest and more info for you and your career. Thanks for subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show. And remember, you can plan for success, but you can't reach it without execution. Peace to the colleagues. I put in work and watch my status escalate. <laughs> Brought to you by PlatformCollection.com. Com, com, com.